Hello, everyone. I am Noah Swartz. I am a staff technologist at the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the EFF is a nonprofit set in the US which defends online digital civil liberties. So we do a bunch of things. We do litigation, which is we fight court cases to try to affect uh, free speech laws and civil liberty laws that deal with the digital realm. We do some activism. We'll you know, get people organized to uh, you know, write their Congress people or other government officials to change the law. And we also write a bunch of technology, which is the group that I'm in. So you may be familiar with our browser plugin, HTTPS Everywhere, which redirects you to the HTTPS version of a given site. Or our upcoming project, which is Let's Encrypt, which will be an automated certificate authority. Um, or our fingerprinting website, Panopticlick, which I'll talk about later in this talk. And I'm here to talk to you about Privacy Badger, which is our newest browser extension. We released it last Thursday. Um, but I want to remind everyone that I am a technologist at the EFF, and I am not a lawyer, so I cannot give you legal advice, but feel free to ask me technology questions. Um, so we're going to talk about browser tracking, uh, how ubiquitous it is on the web and what a big problem it is, why your privacy matters, um, who's doing it, how are they doing it, and what you can do to protect yourself, which is where a privacy badger will come in. So you may have noticed when you've loaded a website recently that not all of the content on that website came from one source. When you go to websites, there's a lot of third-party uh, information on these various websites. So basic things like images or sometimes CSS files can be stored on CDNs, so you get like a cached version of the website, or the images are cached closer to you, so they load faster. But also now we have things like web fonts, or you'll get like Google Maps tiles on a certain website. So you'll have some service that's being provided by a third party. Uh, a lot of websites use analytics engines, where third parties sort of try to track uh, what you're doing on a website to provide analytics about clicks on a single domain. Um, on news articles, a very prevalent one are these sort of social media widgets. So share this on Facebook or tweet this link. And those images are being sourced by third parties. So when that loads, it goes to Facebook for the image of the Facebook share button. And it even loads JavaScript from Facebook. And then obviously, the most noticeable, if you're not running an ad blocker, are ads. So when you go to the New York Times, it's got a bunch of ads, or CNN.com. They all have a bunch of ads. And these are all served by third parties um, on the fly often targeting you specifically. So people are doing real-time bids on these ads to, to make sure they're showing you the right one. Um, so how is your browser being tracked? Uh, these requests can write and read cookies in your browser. So just like you would have a cookie for a login for Facebook or for Google, these third parties are writing a cookie to your browser when you go to the New York Times. So every ad service that loads an ad every distinct one, goes up to your browser and it says, hey, do you have a cookie from us? You know, we're doubleclick.net, do you have a double-click cookie? And if your browser doesn't, it says, okay, great, now your user, you know, 7,438. And then the next time you go to a website that loads a double-click ad, it asks if you have a cookie, and it says, oh, great, your user 7,438. I remember that, you know, you were looking at these websites last week, and they build up this big profile of you uh, as you, as you browse across different sites, anything where their third party is being loaded. But they can also use other sort of distinctive elements about your browser, such as uh, this canvas element in HTML5, which does stuff with your GPU to get a fingerprint. Um, they can also write these things that are called super cookies, which are storage options in other libraries. So HTML5 has a local storage option, and they can store things in that HTML5 local storage and then read it back uh, when you go to other domains or you load the site again. And then in addition to having these trackers on visible ads, they have these things called tracking pixels, which are sort of one-by-one -one images that load and then serve these cookies as well. So even if you don't see a visible ad on a website, it's still possible for a third party to be tracking you. Um, obviously, this is a big business. Ads and tracking are everywhere on the web. Um, but we've seen a big move recently from visible ads to the sort of tracking of users and monetizing of user data. 
So this is an image of the EFF project Panopticlick, uh, where you can go to it, and it will tell you how unique your browser looks to us. So it has a big database of browsers and information about them, and then it checks your information against the other information in the browser, and it tells you how unique you are. So this is me from earlier this morning, and I am completely unique out of the five and a half million users who have ever gone to Panopticlick. Um, so these are a bunch of ways that someone can figure out things about your browser, but imagine an advertiser doing that on a site. With only a few of them, you're still probably unique out of all of the visitors to that site, because most sites don't have five million unique visitors. Um, and so this is the problem. This is what we want to prevent advertisers from being able to do, so that you can browse the web anonymously and not be followed around. So the question is, who is tracking you online? As I said, it's a bunch of advertisers, but it's also these sort of data aggregators. So Axiom on this list is just a data aggregator, and they build up profiles of people, and then other marketers can go up to them and ask for certain subsets of the population. They can say, you know, I want to look for single dads in the Denver area, and Axiom will give them a big list of people to advertise to you. And that's the people who are, who are selling your data. And then you see also Facebook is a big advertiser in addition to being a social media network. So when they're reading things about your browsing, especially on news sites, they're using that to, to sell to advertisers as well on your Facebook site. Um, so the problem with these trackers is that they're all third parties. They're not the site you were trying to go to. So when you go to the New York Times, you know, you expect New York Times content to be served to you. And when you go to Facebook, maybe you expect Facebook to track things about you on Facebook, but not on other sites. And so a lot of these first party websites, you've probably at some point agreed to an end user license agreement with them. You've clicked through some agreement. So at least there's sort of a standard of what you expect them to do with your data, whether or not you, know, you read it or you understand it, or if it's even reasonable. But at least there's something there. For these third-party trackers, there's nothing. You've never agreed to their service, so they have this data on you, which they can use however they want. And you have no idea how they're going to use it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it's completely ubiquitous. It's, it's on basically every site. It has some sort of social media button or some ad or probably an analytics engine. So it's all over, uh, which makes it really hard to avoid. And these companies have very strong financial, financial incentives to keep doing this. We can't just ask them politely to stop because they've built you know, multi-billion dollar businesses on this. Um, so you may say, like, oh, but I like targeted ads. You know, I hate it when I get ads for things I don't care about. It's really nice to have targeted ads. But these third parties, there's, as I said before, there's no rules that what they do with your information. So they don't need to anonymize it, and they can store it for however long they want. They can sell it to whoever they want for whatever they want. And you have no idea what they have and what they're going to do with it. So it's completely out of your control, which is scary enough to me, especially when advertisers have gotten into hot water previously with selling data to the US military to search for terrorists. Um, but you can imagine someone hacking one of these databases and getting a lot of information about you. Um, and then they can also misuse this targeted advertising for a bunch of things. So there's two pictures at the bottom. One is a Wall Street Journal article about how the office supply store Staples was finding people who were close to their competitor, Office Max, and offering them better prices if they clicked through one of these ads that was targeted specifically based on their location. And maybe you don't care about office supplies, but you can imagine it being for something higher stakes. And you can imagine it being something more fine-grained than location. So we have this like, you know, two-tiered or multi-tiered system where advertisers are giving different people way different uh, versions of their websites based on all this tracking data. And then the second image is from this report about uh, the housing crash, the subprime loan uh, crash in the US around 2008. And these advertisers uh, went out and they wanted to direct market to people who hadn't bought mortgages before. Um, and so they used all this data to find people in communities that didn't have mortgage lenders, and they specifically targeted them with online uh, mortgage ads. And it turned out that these were the people selling the subprime loans. And it turns out that the people who lived in areas that didn't have brick and mortar places to get loans were people in the African-American community in the US. So they got sold all these subprime loans. And when the housing market crashed, they all lost their houses. So it disproportionately affected 
you know, a very serious group of people in the US. So even if you're not concerned about the effects of targeted advertising on you, I think it's easy to see that it can have really bad effects for society if it's unstoppable. Um, but don't worry, it's not just advertisers who are happily reading these cookies. It is also the NSA and lots of other spying organizations. Many of these tracking cookies are transmitted over HTTP. They are not encrypted, and anyone in between you and the advertiser's server gets to read all this information, including your unique ID for that website. So if you look at some of the slides the NSA has, they're very excited about these cookies. This is an actual NSA slide where they're just like, yes, cookies. Um, and they break it down and it says, you know, you have a unique identifier for a person that's distinct from their IP address. Um, and we can use it to correlate their traffic between multiple things. So even if you move around and the NSA gets your X key score, like collects things in X key score between multiple browsing sessions of you, as long as your browser hasn't been cleared and you're going to the same websites, um, you're going to send this HTTP cookie with this advertising unique ID. And then the NSA just knows it's you again without having to do any extra work. And so they talk very happily about this Yahoo ID, which apparently has a machine identifying uh, identifier in it. So, or a cookie with a, a machine identifying uh, ID in it. So it doesn't matter where you are or how much you clear your browser, the NSA is going to also get information about you. So these things scare me. Uh, this is why I think online targeted advertising is bad. Uh, and I don't think I need to convince all of you that privacy online is important. And there's been a lot of talk about the sort of chilling effects of knowing you're being monitored. So you may say, like, oh, I have nothing to hide. And then as soon as you want to go to a website that maybe is anti-authoritarian or possibly embarrassing, you're going to self-censor and not go to it because you know you're being tracked on all of these websites, uh, which makes it very hard to go about life as you normally would without the fear of surveillance. Um, so how can it be stopped? There's lots of ways people often propose for how to protect yourself from online tracking. A common one that I hear when I tell people about Privacy Badger is incognito mode. A lot of browsers have this incognito mode where they won't store information between sessions. So you'll have these cookies temporarily for a specific browser session, and then it will clear them when you close your, your browser. Uh, but that only protects you between sessions, right? So if I leave that session open for a long time or I go to a lot of uh, websites in that session, you can still correlate um, at that time because it's not, not reading cookies. It's just not storing them between sessions. And I went to the New York Times and then I went to you know, like an AIDS policy website and they had the same CDN or the same uh, tracking pixels on them then you know, the NSA would know that I'm at both of them and this advertiser would, and maybe it gets sold to Axiom, et cetera. Um, and incognito mode is also hard because it's very cumbersome on you because all of your first party cookies get wiped between browsers. So if you use a lot of web services like Gmail or Facebook, you have to log in every time, which becomes very cumbersome, which makes people only use uh, incognito mode when they're looking at these sort of sites that they don't want people to see. So their normal browsing history is still getting captured by these advertisers. Um, and then still vulnerable to fingerprinting. Uh, they can still fingerprint your machine. They can read your fonts and stuff like that. Uh, or there are some zombie cookies where your, IP, your internet service provider might inject something into your web request header, and then they'll remember to resurrect a cookie that you, was, you were given previously. Um, Tor Browser solves a lot of these issues, uh, and it's great for private browsing. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't use it all the time. So, uh, and it's not yet sort of a, a scalable solution for everyone. So I think there still need to be tools that protect people, you know, a normal person uh, who isn't willing to use Tor from this online tracking. Um, ad blockers are another thing people use a lot. Uh, but ad blockers are typically focused on visible ads. So they don't necessarily block these invisible trackers. And often, they'll not block the request to the ad server. They'll delete it from the DOM after it's loaded. So these, this cookie stuff will still get sent between them. Uh, and they work on a blacklist. They have a big list of things that they think are ads, and advertisers 
you know, sort of read this list and then make ads that get around this. And it's just sort of this arms race where, you know, they'll blacklist something and advertisers will do something new and they'll blacklist something out. And there's no way out for advertisers. There's no way that they can stop being uh, blocked by these ad blockers. Um, and sometimes these ad blockers have a financial incentive and they're not always trustworthy. So Adblock Plus will take, sometimes take donations from advertisers to allow their ads through their blacklist. Ghostry, uh, by default, sells uh, information about what ads you're blocking back to the advertisers so they know what are the, the sort of creepy ads that people are afraid of. Um, people have done some policy work on this. The W3C uh, adopted a do not track standard. So you can send a header with your web request saying that you don't want to be tracked. But unfortunately, no advertisers really honor this. So you can send it to the advertisers all you want. They're not going to do anything. They're still going to track you. And it hasn't really been adopted by anyone. So we would like to see a world where it can be adopted by people and you don't have to install a third party extension to have advertisers honor your uh, request not to be tracked. Uh, the advertisers seeing an opening formed the Digital Advertisers Alliance where they're like, oh, you know, it was really hard for the W3C to regulate us. Let us regulate ourselves. Um, you just tell us you want to opt out and we'll happily stop showing you targeted advertisements. But we won't anonymize your data and we won't stop tracking you. We just won't show you the targeted ads. So that's not really a solution either and it's not legally binding. And even this very lax standard has only been limitedly adopted. Uh, so the EFF thinks we have a solution. We have come up with Privacy Badger, which was just released last Thursday, as I said. Uh, I will tell you what it does, and I will try to explain the name to you. So here is the Privacy Badger. That's it celebrating its 1.0 release in our office in San Francisco. Uh, it is the reason it is named Privacy Badger. And what it is is a Chrome and Firefox extension that tries to block all tracking uh, automatically through an algorithm rather than having a blacklist. And the idea is to make it very easy for people to use and to not break the web as you're browsing. So it's very low friction. Um, it's GPL v3. You're welcome to uh, submit pull requests, uh, but I'll get to that later. And so. We also think we have a way to solve this arms race problem, which uh, is also coming up. Um, so how it works is it has your browser send this do not track header along with all of your requests. Um, and then it watches and sees what third parties you're loading on a given site. If that third party is doing something uh, to try to track you, we'll add it to a list. And if we see it across multiple first party domains, we'll block it. Um, so. Uh, if you go to a website like the New York Times, you may get all these ads that are third parties that you might expect to see on other websites, but you might also get all of the New York Times CDN being loaded to load images for the New York Times. So if you go to CNN.com and you go to maybe Gawker, and these ads are on all three of them, you'll see the ads across three domains, and Privacy Badger will block it, but it won't block any of their specific CDNs. So here's an image of it on New York Times, and all of these New York Times CDNs are whitelisted because you haven't seen them on any other sites. So what this, you have a little slider that goes from red to yellow to green. Red means it's blocking the request. Yellow means it's anonymizing it by preventing cookies from being read or written. And green means that it's being let through uh, untouched, which is what you would hope for for like the images on NewYorkTimes.com. Um, and so we want to block high entropy cookies that can uniquely identify you, like we showed in the panopticlick thing. You know, if it has enough bits of entropy to identify you out of you know the entire population of the world or all the people who might go to that website, then that's a cookie we want to block and where we want to mark as a tracking cookie. Um, so we also want to make it sort of seamless. So there are a lot of things that might get blocked because they look like trackers, but they aren't. And so we have a, a gray list of domains that we will only set to an be anonymized, but we'll still let the content through. And these are things like the Creative Commons button or like Google Fonts and stuff like that uh, that might break websites or make web browsing really difficult. Um, so the things we detect, as I said, are cookies um, from HTTP and JavaScript, uh, HTML5 super cookies, and this canvas fingerprinting where they read the HTML5 canvas element. Um, so this is Privacy Badger on boingboing.net. And you can see some things are green, and the yellow things are sort of things that allow the site to exist. So fonts.google and this Creative Commons thing. 
Um, but here it is on Gawker, and you see all these advertisers are being blocked, and then Kinja, which is Gawker CDN, is being allowed because it, you, you would only see it on Gawker. Um, so in addition to all of its automated settings, you as a user have complete control over it. You can override any of these settings, either for the whole top-level domain or for any specific subdomain of it. Um, and you can disable Privacy Badger entirely for a site if the site's not working because of Privacy Badger. Um, we also do uh, sort of click to play on things that you might want but that are getting blocked like privacy, by Privacy Badger. For example, all the comments on YouTube are Google Plus, so there's sort of this warning when you click it, it says like, would you like to enable it just for this website so that you can comment on YouTube. Um, so here's some pictures. The left is Privacy Badger disabled on a site and you see the icons grayed out and there's no information about the trackers and then on the right are some things that I've set and the little arrow allows it to revert control to what Privacy Badger was expecting to do for that domain. So you can kind of use it to debug a site or to, to block uh, something if you think it's a tracker and Privacy Badger hasn't flagged it as such. Um, also, we block these social widgets, the little you know, Facebook-like buttons on websites. So here's a picture from an a article talking about Eurovision. Um, and you can see they have this little Privacy Badger icon. So it doesn't load the image from the third party. It has a local version that it sources. And I think you can click to play. Uh, and it will like, re-enable it. But by default, you won't be leaking information through these. Um, so what about third parties that aren't tracking users? Well, they can agree to the EFF's new DNT policy that we just released. Um, you can read it at EFF.org slash DNT hyphen policy. Um, but sites can host it and legally agree to follow what it says. Uh, and then you'll have a guarantee that your data is not being personally identified on their servers. And you can know that they are not tracking you. Um, so. It says things like they won't store identifying information about you, no unique IDs for users, so it'll all be anonymized. They can keep it for a little bit amount of time, you know, so they can store a log of aggregate data, but it's, it's not identifying to any specific user. And I think the limit's very short. Um, you know, they can, they're allowed to do debug and security things, but they won't sell any of this data to people without ensuring that they also agree to this do not track policy. Um, and then sites that adopt it, your privacy badger will check before it blocks this domain and it will uh, whitelist it. So here's an image um, where, I can't read the things from here, but do not tracker.org has posted the DNT policy, so privacy badger is respecting it and not blocking the domain, whereas like eviltracker.com is being blocked because it is an evil tracker. And so this is an upcoming improvement to our panoptic click site where you can test your browser for a uh, tracker blocker. And so soon, it is not yet released, but it'll look like that. Um, so we drafted this in conjunction with Disconnect, which is uh, for a public good company in California. And we got adoption from Mixpanel, which is uh, like an analysis engine, Medium, which is a uh, hoster of articles, and Adblock Plus, which is a different ad blocker. Um, and I think we have about half a million users covered through these four companies uh, who will now get the benefits of uh, these do not track opt-outs. But hopefully more people will agree to it, especially these sort of advertisers or online trackers. Um, so that is Privacy Badger. And I hope you all install it. Uh, I have a few more things to say. But yeah, you should go to EFF.org slash PB and install Privacy Badger and uh, protect yourself from online trackers. Uh, there's still you know, some work to be done. There's many more things we could, we could uh, detect. There's, uh, we could have a nicer UI. We've localized it into four languages, but we could always use more languages. And we'd like to see more people adopt our DNT policy. Um, you can help by using Privacy Badger. Uh, and reporting broken sites. There's a, a thing you can click and report sites that are broken. Um, you can submit bug reports on our GitHub or make pull requests if you're a developer. Uh, or if you run a website, you can uh, respect people who send the DNT flag uh, or the DNT header. And you can also host our DNT policy at a dot well-known address. Um, but browsers can also do things to protect against tracking. We would like to see more browsers adopt these 
uh, so that you don't need extensions. Uh, Firefox has been working on this tracking protection thing, and we hope to see it released soon. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'm out of time. So that is Privacy Badger, and uh, hopefully you all now know how to protect yourself from online tracking. Oh, and I have stickers, so if you want some Privacy Badger stickers, come find me afterwards. Sounds good. We still have about three minutes left for questions, so line up, line up at the microphones. And I think we will do the right one from here first. One, uh, we have audio. I have one tiny correction, actually. It's not Adblock Plus, but Adblock, who are implementing the DNT policy. Of course, we'd love Adblock Plus to do it, too. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Um, are these do not track policies audited or verified in any way? Because yeah, so EFF posts one on its website, and uh, Privacy Badger has a list of hashes of acceptable ones. Um, and then when the website hosts it, Privacy Badger checks the hash it has locally against the hash of the one hosted on the remote website. And if they match, then. No, uh, I, I mean, like, if the website claims it does not keep logs, like, is that verified? Like, do they have to open their logs? Because if not, if I would be evil tracker, I would just say, yeah, yeah, no logs. No, 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 we are a good tracker. Uh, the idea is that they could be sued uh, for all the users that they um, disrespect with regards to this. And advertisers have expressed that they're very concerned about these sort of, uh, like, market policies. Uh, but. Uh, we don't necessarily have a way to compel them to give us information. Thank you. So, the other microphone, please. Um, yeah, I have a related question. Um, if you whitelist, um, or in this case, greenlist, uh, uh, a, a tracking a site based on the fact that they res claim to respect uh, the do not track policy, do you make, uh, give it to the user a visual, visual difference that it's uh, based on the policy and not because they're not using cookies? Sorry, I didn't. So um, now, now it is green if they don't use cookies at all, and then it's yellow if if you load it anyhow. Uh -huh. So if if a site is using cookies but you whitelist it because of the policy, yeah. is it then the same kind of green that is now cookies, or is there a visible difference that you say, okay, but it, it was whitelisted? Yeah, yeah, it shows this little uh, DNT image. Yeah, here. Okay, so that's cool. You see this little DNT image, and you know that they've posted the do not track policy. And then it shows that it's sort of like set by privacy better, and you can revert it or override it. So next question, please. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, I've been using various ad blockers and privacy-based browser extensions for forks of the Firefox web browser for several years. Mm -hmm. And recently, I've been stumbled upon a fork or a, um, a version of U-Matrix that has been ported over from the Chromium slash Chrome-based browser world by Ryan Gorehill. And I find that user interface to be very impressive for how much fine-grained control it gives you to block cookies, JavaScript, CSS, uh, images, um, what have you, from different domains on mm -hmm. the page. And I'm wondering if anybody at the EFF has looked at the user interface of this extension to compare how they implement uh, privacy protection? Uh, I have not. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do in Privacy Badger is make it very easy to use so that someone who didn't really understand all the mechanics of the web could still protect themselves uh, in a reasonable way. And I've heard a lot of praise for the sliders, but we're definitely always looking for, for new ways to express these things. So I will go look at you, Matrix. Yes, please do. And thank you for your work. Yeah. So, so uh, any more questions? Doesn't look so. So thank you, Noah, very much for your talk, for showing us the privacy badger. This is your applause. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Cool.